All right. Looks like we're live. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for everyone for uh, for joining us here at the Birch Aquarium. My name is Jose. Uh, I might be a little bit of a familiar face. I'm an ocean educator who has been on a few of our broadcasts here uh, with the Birch Aquarium. And joining me right below in this box uh, is my friend, ocean educator, Matt. How are you doing this afternoon, Matt? I'm doing great. The sun is shining here in Southern California. Uh, it's a great day and I get to talk about some of my favorite topics. So I'm thrilled to be here. That's really good to hear. The weather has been really nice lately. <laughs> and that's something that I appreciate about being able to still be in Southern California where, you know, there, there are worse places to be stuck inside. Absolutely, absolutely. I haven't seen much of the May gray and I'm very thankful for that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's definitely an advantage of being in uh, Southern California. Uh, yeah. So I'm gonna, turn this slide over to the next thing. Uh, this is a really big picture of you and you look a little different. I do uh, look a little different. <laughs> I can't put yeah. I can't put my finger on what is different about you in there. <laughs> Me um, uh, but we see this nice big birch aquarium uh, patch on your jacket there. You're smiling, you're out on the water. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and what you've been doing at the aquarium uh, for the last year or so. Absolutely. So um, like Jose, Jose said earlier, my name is Matt. I'm one of the many marine science educators that we have at the Birch Aquarium as part of Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And in this photo right here, you can see me um, in the action. This is from one of our whale watching cruises that we have every single year where we get to go out and hopefully see some of those elusive gray whales as they make their migration. And whale watching is one of the most important or exciting parts about the, the job for me because you get out onto the water and see those animals in their natural habitat. And I feel like that uh, that's part of the big, I feel like that's a big reason that you love, the, love your job, right? Where it's a chance to show the public at large all of these things firsthand and be more just generally educated about these kinds of things, right? Absolutely. Um, personally, I get a lot of my inspiration from the uh, instruction and the opportunities that I am able to build with uh, guests of all ages and creeds and location races as well. So uh, whether they're coming from a local San Diego perspective like myself or from an international location where they can't really see our great blue Pacific Ocean here in California, those lights up my day to be able to facilitate that learning experience, grow a little bit more compassion and empathy for the ocean, um, as well as have some of those really incredible once in a lifetime experiences as well. And that universality is really, really important. I'm really glad that you're able to do that. Yes. Um, I had another question here. I just tabbed away, <laughs> tabbed away for a second. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got your start? Because I mean, uh, you're clearly you're clearly pretty early in your career, but I feel like you've gotten the chance and opportunity to do a lot of unique things. How did you kind of get set on this path? Absolutely. So for me personally, growing up in San Diego, being a local and being so close to the ocean, I have gotten a lot of my inspiration from the local habitats and environments that we have here in San Diego, the, the unique ones that we do have. Um, especially. So for me, being able to combine the science background and the understanding behind a lot of these complex processes and be able to break it down and communicate that effectively to, to all audiences has always been a driving factor. Um, for me, education is always the most important part about conservation because it allows people to equip themselves with the skills and um, abilities necessary to think critically about how we can protect and save and um, encourage the growth of our habitats, not only here in San Diego, but around the world as well. And you can see that through a lot of the Scripps research and science that we have um, through the aquarium and through the institution itself. And I know that all of, uh, all of our colleagues over at the aquarium truly appreciate how universal you're able to make uh, all of those kinds of things and how much you're able to share with all sorts of different people. So uh, I know I've said it before, but I'm gonna say it again, thanks so much for everything uh, you do do and you have done and will continue to do. Absolutely, thank you, it's my pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> and as you can see, we are working from home at the moment, but we're still trying to find different unique opportunities to be able to share all of these things with all of you over on the other end. Uh, so my dogs are barking right now. Uh, <laughs> clearly I'm at home. Matt, you're at home, you're safe. Yes, I'm, I'm at home currently, um, keeping us safe and social distant from um, 
from everyone out there and, and staying sane as well by involving myself in the ocean a little bit more. Yeah, I, I think it does kind of refresh us to be able to share uh, what we are so excited about and what we do uh, love and care about the ocean uh, mm -hmm. with everyone, right? Absolutely, everybody. You can even uh, talk to a lot of my friends. They'll say, even when we're at the beach for a casual day, I'll be spitting out information and facts and, and knowledge about the sand and the water and the animals that live there. So there's always an opportunity to, to be an educator and be educated yourself. And I always like to revel in every single opportunity that I get to um, share my passion and my heart and empathy about the ocean with everyone else as well. Yep. And going back to the whale watching cruises, uh, Mm -hmm. Here is a great, great shot of you in your element uh, <laughs> on those whale watching cruises. Uh, we've given you something to amplify that voice and be able to share that excitement. You can see that he's having a lot of fun up there, folks, this side. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, uh, this yeah. side. Uh, he's having a lot of fun up there. Yeah. Uh, we always have a ton of fun on our whale boats. Um, you can see from the horizon that we're out in the Pacific Ocean. I believe I was looking at some dolphins or maybe even a gray whale in this particular photo, but you really do never know what you're gonna get out, even at our local coastline here in San Diego. And these gray whales are uh, a great opportunity to go and experience some of the more worldly or, worldly or cosmopolitan species that might live in our oceans as well. Nice. And uh, speaking of that microphone, I know how much you love the ocean, but you have another true love out there as well, right? Absolutely. I do love music <laughs> and, and the sound that goes along with it. So a lot of my focus and a lot of my passion comes from sound in the ocean and on land, of course, and how it interacts with the different <laughs> media of air and water. Um, and of course, those really high notes that maybe Mariah Carey or some other singers can hit as well. Um, <laughs> Maybe not quite uh, as impressive as some of these animals, though. Yeah, but we're going to get a chance to see that firsthand today, aren't we? Absolutely. We are 100% going to get a chance to see that. Or uh, yeah, I Yeah, I guess we do use multiple senses, and I guess we are going to focus a little more on our ears today. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to turn this to all of you lovely folks in the audience before we begin. What do you think the ocean sounds like before we dive in there? <laughs> oh, man, these ocean puns are going to be... Uh, going all day today, I'm sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if you think that, uh, I've got a few. Wait until you, uh, wait until Matt gets going, because we're really going to get a lot of these today. Uh, we're going to get a lot in. Um, so I'm going to turn this question around to you while we wait for uh, some of our guests to respond. What do you think the ocean sounds like, Matt? Well, I know that on land, sound can manifest in a lot of different ways. Maybe we hear really high-pitched uh, noises from some birds chirping or some low growls or grunts from some of our uh, at-home pets. Um, and even when it gets super loud, you can hear those jets in the air breaking the sound barrier. So I know there's a lot of variety in sound, so maybe there's a lot of variety underwater as well. That's my best guess. Yeah, that's a really good guess, I think. Uh, and you're doing a great job of drawing from a lot of your experiences there. Uh, it looks like Tina in the comments says, it's noisy, uh, which I'm sure is absolutely true, right? I, uh, I would bet so. I would hope, I would think so. But you never know what's on there. A lot yeah, of people I know. think the ocean is a little bit more calm and serene, mm -hmm. though. So maybe it is a little bit quieter, too. Maybe mm -hmm. one of the two. Yeah, I know even on my street, if I stop and just be quiet for a second, I'm going to be able to hear sound coming from all over the place. So I guess it makes sense that the ocean would be noisy. Yeah, maybe so. Let's get some of those hypotheses down in the chat. You guys have an idea about what it might sound like? Go ahead and put it on in there. Maybe there's areas or regions that might be a little bit louder than others. You can think about that as well. Yeah. Um, to your for earlier point, I think um, must would be that it's going to sound a little like different animals sound on land, where we'd be able to hear all of that all over the place. If I were in a kelp forest, I would expect it to sound um, sound a little like birds. Actually, I don't know why. I think fish sound like birds. That's just something that makes sense to me in my head. Yeah, maybe uh, turning oh. over to the comments again. Yeah, um, it looks like Ralph says that drawing from his personal experiences uh, when he scuba dives. Uh, it's pretty quiet. Uh, he also has a follow-up question. What kind of equipment do you use when you're recording sound in the ocean? Do you happen to know that, Matt? I believe some of our researchers at Scripps do use hydrophones to con um, collect that data and that information about 
what our oceans sound like. So I think there is a, a specialized microphone that works underneath the water to collect that data for us to analyze out of the water. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if my USB mic microphone would be very happy if I just dropped it into the ocean. So they need to have specialized things to make sure that those hydrophones are more water resistant, but it's the same general concept, right? Mm -hmm. It's a microphone, it just works underwater. Absolutely. That's always the complexity with studying, is the ocean, studying the ocean. You have to think about all these new different ways to collect this data that wouldn't normally work on land too. So it's always a very innovative process to study the ocean. And it's really bridging uh, the gap between creativity and uh, the logical mindedness that both exist in all of us, where uh, as scientists, we get a lot of opportunities to be creative, to solve problems like, okay, my microphone is not going to be happy if I just drop it in a glass of water. So what can I do so I can hear what's happening underwater? Exactly, exactly. That's the way you got to think about it. Mm -hmm. All right. So it looks like we have a couple more responses. Uh, it looks like Piper, who is seven, thinks that the ocean is calm and wavy. Mm. Uh, and our friend Lindsay, uh, I think she might be drawing a little from personal experience here, but our friend Lindsay says that the ocean has a lot of crunching and popping noises, especially around coral reefs. Mm. Maybe so. I know that a lot of our, our fish might make something similar to that. Maybe they're munching on some of that coral as well as part of the habitats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I never thought about it, but coral probably would be crunchy, wouldn't it? Yeah, probably. They've got uh, that and skeleton that helps them <laughs> be nice and sturdy. Mm. Yes. Uh, and Omar, I have also wondered what the ocean sounds like. Uh, and it is a fascinating place. So I feel like we may as well answer your question and move right along. Uh, Matt and I have collected five different ocean sounds from uh, all around um, animals that we would be able to see at the Birch Aquarium or with the Birch Aquarium. Uh, we're going to start off with this guy over here. This is a Garibaldi. Um, what we're going to do is Matt and I are going to introduce our animals. Uh, we're going to ask you guys what you think the animals sound like. And then Matt and I are going to talk a little bit about what we think the animals might sound like. And you know, Tina, you are getting a little ahead of us. <laughs> we do have a couple of whale songs in here. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to draw from those past experiences and make really good guesses about what whales sound like. Yes. Um, so starting with the Scarabaldi, it's this really, really vibrant color. It's a bright orange. Uh, this guy is really interesting because it's the state marine fish of California. What mm -hmm. does everyone think the Garibaldi sounds like? Hmm. I mean, I already told you that I think fish just sound like birds. So I'm expecting this to be like a little chirpy fish, yeah, especially because it is like bright orange like a songbird, right? Yeah, maybe you can kind of make that connection between the species, even though they don't live in the same areas. They might have some of those similar adaptations or sounds that help them survive or get what they need from the ocean habitat. So I think that chirping or clicks might be a good guess, but you know, I'm not I'm not too sure how they would make that noise or, or where it would come from too. So we always have to think about that as well. Mm. You're absolutely right. The different kinds of parts that they have to make noise would change what kinds of noises they can make a lot. Like we have special, uh, we have special things in our throats that help us make sound different, uh, different kinds of sound. Uh, we move our lips to make different kinds of sound. I just said that, but uh, that's how we talk, right? We're having a conversation by making noise, uh, but we're using special body parts to be able to do that, special adaptations to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Exactly, but I don't think fish have lips quite like we do, so they might be using something yeah. else. Uh, looks like we've got a couple of guesses for quiet here. So it looks like Catherine thinks our Garibaldi are going to be quiet. Uh, Ralph has seen a lot when he's been diving, uh, but he's never heard one. So mm -hmm. drawing again from personal experience here. Yeah. Maybe uh, there are, is there um, anything else we know about Garibaldi? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a very important point. Uh, should I just play the sound clip now or? I would love to give it a hear. I would love to, to hear what they sound like. Uh, come again. <laughs> I would love to hear what they sound like. I think we should hit that button and, and listen to some Garibaldi yeah. noises. 
And as you guys can see, I probably need to use critical listening a little better here uh, as well. All right, so I'm going to hit the sound clip, and we're going to listen to our Garibaldi. So there's a lot of low rumbling, and, and I heard a little bit of thumping in there too, but it kind of just sounded like almost waves crashing. So maybe that could be a, um, we think they're so quiet in the ocean as we always just hear the waves instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely kind of blends into that kind of, uh, ambient noise all around it, right? Where it sounds a lot like its habitat where the waves are going to be moving back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that kind of lines up with what a lot of you are thinking. Sorry, go ahead, Matt. I was going to say, do you know how the Garibaldi makes these noise? Do you know um, how they're able to do that or why? Uh, it has to do with some specialized body parts they have, right? Like how we have uh, we have our larynx and our voice box and our throats. They're going to have um, something by their uh, by their gill structures that they're able to thump back and forth. Yep. They do. And the Garibaldi, of course, is the California state marine fish for that golden orange color. But they also have yeah. that color as a way of warning other fish about their burrows or maybe their foraging grounds. Mm -hmm. And I think that they might be using that noise as well to warn other animals too. I think that's a really good hypothesis, thinking mm -hmm. about how this animal looks and how it behaves and how sound fits into that picture as well. Uh, before we move on, it said uh, Andy over in our comments section is asking if these Garibaldi go through multiple juvenile color stages uh, like many anglerfish do. Um, so the Garibaldi, they actually do. Uh, when they are juveniles or really young, they're going to have these really vibrant uh, purple or almost blue spots to identify them as juveniles instead of as adult fish. So that way these adult fish don't go ahead and um, attack or fight their own babies until they're they're fully grown and adults. So just like a lot of other angelfish, um, our Garibaldi is going to have some similar color patterns um, on them as well. Nice. Yeah. And Ralph would also like to add that our Garibaldi is a protected species, and it is. Uh, yeah. It's one of the one of the perks of being the state fish, right? Mm-hmm. You can find them a lot in our kelp forests just off the coast here uh, in California, kind of meandering around in our marine protected areas. So um, once you're able to go out there and snorkel again, um, make sure you check it out. You can always see them swing around. And they're easy to spot, too, because that really bright orange color, it makes it very helpful for us. Have you ever seen this animal in the kelp forest? I have not seen them in the kelp forest, but I know <laughs> uh, that they uh, occasionally will meander their way in there. They're very very playful species, of course, very large as well. It can be a little hard to get in and navigate through those long um, stipes and blades of kelp as well, though. Uh, so who's this guy? It's, I, I know it's an animal that you know quite a bit about. Yes, we're very familiar with the gray whale, especially here in San Diego. The gray whale is, of course, a baleen whale uh, that has the longest uh, migration of any mammal in the world. So they go from the Alaskan seas all the way down to Mexico every single year. I believe it's about 14,000 miles round trip as well. So they do go quite the distance. Um, but I'm not, I don't think I've ever heard one underwater, though. Have you ever heard a gray whale before, Jose? Not underwater. I think uh, we'd need to use one of those hydrophones like we mentioned earlier. Because um, uh, these, I'm not sure that these guys click and whistle a lot above the water, which might be a little hint to how these guys sound. Uh, so just like with the Garibaldi, you guys can feel free to make your guesses as to what this animal sounds like uh, over in our comments. Uh, I don't think I have heard this animal personally. I don't think so. I have either. I think that'd be a, a really interesting treat. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, but these guys are really magnificent. You mentioned that uh, you mentioned that they are really important here in San Diego. You see them a lot when they are on their migration route. Mm -hmm. uh, and what about all of those other things that I'm seeing uh, around that animal's snout, that animal's rostrum? What are those animals? Yeah, so if you notice, they, of course, are uh, a gray whale, so they tend to be a little bit more gray in color, but they have these brown uh, bumps or spots 
oftentimes on their rostrum or their front part of their face or around their blowhole on the very, very top of their, almost like their head if we had our nose up here on the top of our head. Um, those are barnacles that grow on our, our animals, our gray whales, um, from the moment that they're born until the, the day they die, which can be up to around, I believe 70 years is one of the estimates. Oh, wow. But it's hard to tell how long they can live because they're so big, but there's oceans just as big as well. Um, but those animals do form a symbiotic relationship on our gray whales. So they act almost like uh, an exfoliator. They break off that dead skin um, and give it some new fresh layer of skin for our gray whale to grow underneath. So even though they maybe look like they're hitching a free ride, they're helping our gray whales out as well. That that teamwork sounds really, really cool. And it's a really special relationship. Uh, and, and gray whales can live a long time. Wow, 70 years. Yes. Uh, and that's just what we estimate. So there's still a lot to be learned about uh, whales, especially, and uh, of course the ocean in general, but our best estimates is about 70 years. Uh, it looks like Madeline wants to know, what is your personal favorite kind of whale and why? Oh, that's a great question, Madeline. Um, I would say that my personal favorite whale is uh, it's actually a porpoise, a lot smaller. It's not one of those large baleen whales that we normally tend to think of. Uh, but my personal favorite whale is the vaquita, which is very small, only about five feet in length. And it's critically endangered um, and it only lives in uh, some coastal waters down in Mexico. Uh, so that's actually one of the reasons why I was so inspired to join Marine Science Education and Conservation uh, as a way to combine the understanding behind our whales and the, the policy and protections that need to be put in place to actually have them thrive in a habitat uh, and grow their population numbers. So the vaquita is my personal favorite. It's also very cute, which of course helps a ton when looking at our animals. What about you, Jose? What's your yeah. favorite whale? My favorite whale is actually coming up uh, in a second here after uh, we get through this animal. I really like humpback whales. Uh, mm -hmm. They're really big uh, and uh, their Latin name uh, translates to big wing from New England. Uh, so, uh, hey, Matt, Matt. Yes. Do you like apples? I love apples. Uh, well, apparently so does the humpback whale uh, because we can see a lot of them over uh, over in Austin. <laughs> oh. Movie references. Don't, don't worry. Um, so uh, it looks like we all have different kinds of whales. We like belugas, vaquitas, humpback whales. Uh, I am going to go ahead and play what our friend the gray whale sounds like. Yes. Oops. So not a very long clip, but I think you guys all heard that, right? Yes. We got that. Like a... Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> To me, it sounds a little bit like almost like an acceler accelerated heartbeat um, or almost like ping pong balls kind of being hit back and yeah. forth really, really quickly. That's exactly what I thought of, where uh, it's this kind of pong, 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 pong noise. Uh, so as I mentioned before, our next animal is also a kind of whale. Uh, now we know a little bit more about whales, so hopefully we'll be able to form really, really good guesses for this one. What does our humpback whale sound like? And while everyone is using uh, their uh, thinking caps, Matt and I are gonna talk a little bit more about humpback whales, which I yes. kind of led into earlier. <laughs> well, they are uh, super charismatic and cool. I, I get why they're your favorite whale. I know I've seen a lot of videos of them doing those really absolutely incredible breaches uh, where the whale pushes their entire body weight out of the water and. Uh, for these whales, it can be upwards of, I think, 35 tons, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that's quite a lot of force that they have to have to push their entire body out of the water. Um, it gives us that really incredible spectacle and a way to connect with them uh, on the land or in a boat, wherever you may be. Mm -hmm. And they do have other specialized adaptations and specialized body parts that help them out. If you're a big animal like that and you want to be able to move uh, really quickly and really, really efficiently through the water, uh, then you're going to have to make sure that you're moving a little more easily. So those really big, uh, we call them pectoral flippers. Those are the two big, uh, I mentioned the big wing from New England. Those are the two big wings, uh, the fin-like body parts that a whale has on its side, a little like our arms. Uh, those pectoral flippers are some of the biggest uh, in, uh, 
in the group of whales in the order of whales. And because they have those little bumps on the end, you guys can probably see it uh, over on the picture uh, over here. They've got all those bumps. Those help, help it move so much faster through the water uh, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like we have a guess here that it might sound like Dory's whale sound from Finding Nemo. That's a I, think, guess. I think that's an incredible guess. Um, of course, that's always one of my favorite movies and uh, getting to talk like a whale was always one of my favorite activities uh, growing up as well. <laughs> Matt, can you still speak whale? Just a little bit. <laughs> I'm a little rusty on my whale, my whale voice and my whale communication. <laughs> You're doing fine, Mr. <laughs> Matt. Uh, and let's see how well we compare to an actual humpback whale. <laughs> it sounds just like it. <laughs> Yeah, I think we nailed it spot on 100%. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a little uh, bit more high pitched than I can go, but you right. know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everyone has their own, uh, everyone has their own vocal range. It's, mm -hmm. you're not a soprano, <laughs> it's fine, that's life. <laughs> yes. Well, I think that humpback whales are one of the most commonly known for their songs, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even more so than the gray whales. I think mm -hmm. that. That humpback whale is the, the traditional whale voice that you, you hear in your head or maybe when you watch Finding Nemo, you experience in media as well. Yeah, uh, I know uh, back in the 1970s, they actually used to release CDs with whale, with whale songs on them. Uh, and I mean, nowadays you can use the internet to find it, but it, mm -hmm. they are that captivating where it feels almost universal that you'd want to listen to it almost like a pop album, like a pop single. Uh, and just put it into your uh, put it into your cassette player, put it into your CD player, and just listen to these guys. Yeah, um, I've even got a CD of Humpback Whale songs um, in my car right now. So even though I'm not driving a ton, I can always listen to it a little bit when I'm driving around. <laughs> uh, it looks like we have another question here from uh, Bob and Karen Mayo. Are certain whales endangered? I think this kind of ties into one of the whales uh, that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, so a lot of whales, because they are so massive or it takes a lot of energy to grow, they have a longer lifespan and a longer time to reach that maturity where they can reproduce. Um, and because some of their byproducts, like their whale oil, was so popular um, back in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, a lot of these animals were hunted down um, for their byproducts, unfortunately. And because it takes so long for their populations to rebound, a lot of our whales are still endangered. Um, I said earlier that my favorite whale is the vaquita, and I believe that is the most critically endangered of all the whale species, including dolphins and porpoises as well. Uh, so monitoring and understanding these animals is in a very important part to helping protect them in their wild habitats as well. And understanding how sound plays a part uh, in interfering with their life can also help us better understand how to protect them in the ocean. That's very true. Mm -hmm. All right, for the next animal, let's take a step back into the birch aquarium walls themselves. Yeah, uh, this guy is really, really interesting and really fascinating. Uh, I know we're talking a little bit more about sound today, but this guy's got really vibrant colors going on as well, right? Yeah, the mantis shrimp, of course, has that really beautiful carapace down its backside, um, almost like its exoskeleton or its shell. Um, and it has these really big eyes that kind of bug out at the very top of its, uh, of its head. Do you know why those eyes are so special, Jose? This is something I can't even fathom because I personally am colorblind. Uh, <laughs> the mantis shrimp can see more colors than even a regularly color vision person <laughs> can see. Uh, they can see shades of purple that we can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're talking a little bit about some of its other senses today. So what do you guys think this guy sounds like? What do mm -hmm. bugs sound like? I don't know. This guy kind of reminds me like of like bugs on land. So I feel like it'd sound a little like maybe like maybe like flapping. Huh. I was thinking like flapping wings, but this animal doesn't have wings. 
doesn't have wings. I was kind of thinking it would sound a little bit more like a cicada with that um, kind of constant rumbling. But I do notice that it has these really big uh, raptorial appendages up in the front. So maybe those make noise um, as well. I'm not too sure how the mantis shrimp makes noise. Yeah, those are both really good trains of thought. Looking <laughs> very, very closely at this animal's, um, this animal's special adaptations. Looks like we have a guess for chirping. Uh, looks like Chase over in the comments is also backing up your cicada guess, uh, Matt. Uh, some more clicks and hisses. Maybe so, so these are all like really insectoid noises, right? Where you can really see that arthropods on land make noise based on how they look and how their different body parts help mm -hmm. them make noise. So it kind of yeah. makes sense that this guy would make noise like that. Of course, just like the humpback whale kind of had a more um, elongated and, and higher pitched sound, almost like a, a mammal would also make. Uh, maybe these guys, because they're closer related to bugs on land, they'll make some of those similar bug noises as well. So Ralph, Sonia, Chase, Madeline, it sounds like you've all kind of got a, a good idea about how bugs sound as well. All right. So let's go ahead and use our listening ears over on this animal. That was like a long groan. Yeah, quite the low growl from our from our mantis shrimp. Uh, so this animal is also using a lot of the same adaptations that an animal like a cicada on land would be using, right? Mm -hmm. I believe what they do is they vibrate their carapace to make that sound. So they, they'll move their body in such a high frequency that it'll actually make a vibrative sound. I think similarly to a cicada, but my, uh, my, my land bug information is not nearly as good as my, my underwater crustacean information. Yeah, you and I are both marine biologists and not terrestrial entomologists. It's absolutely <laughs> we're a little outside of our depth there. Uh, but, but a very unique sound coming from our mantis shrimp, very different than the other sounds we've heard today from our gray whales and our humpback whales and our Garibaldi. And this animal is showing off a little bit in the picture. Uh, but when this animal would be making that noise in real life, it would actually be protecting a burrow that it makes under mm -hmm. its habitat. So yeah. it's kind of like an intruder alarm too. So I guess that's kind of why it sounds a little like a lion's roar. It's trying Maybe. to intimidate whatever's trying to break into its house. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't want to go near any animal that's making that low grumbling or ground, groaning noise. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we've got one more animal and then we're gonna put it all together, Mr. Matt. Perfect. All right. All right. So this guy is one of the seahorses that we have here at the Birch Aquarium. Yeah. Uh, so this is Hippocampus erectus, or the lined seahorse. Uh, once again, we are back inside the walls of the Birch Aquarium for this. What kind of animal is a seahorse, Matt? I doesn't really look like a fish, but I believe they are technically part of the fish group. Um, even though they don't have that streamlined body that we would normally think of when we think of a fish. Yeah. Uh, so if you look really, really closely, you can actually still see all of the same fins that other fish would have. Uh, so over on its head, it's got those two pectoral fins, those two, uh, those two smaller side fins that help most fish steer. Uh, but if you've ever seen, um, if you've ever seen a seahorse swim, you know that they're not quite as good at swimming as other fish are, maybe because they're shaped a little differently than other fish are. Yeah. Well, notice what it's doing with its tail down there. Do you know why it's, it's using its tail like that? These guys can float off really, really easily. So seahorses have what's called a prehensile tail. They can use their tail to handle different things, and they will use that prehensile tail to hitch on or grab on to different things around their habitats. So you see a little bit of seagrass over here, and our seahorse has hitched on like a horse to that seagrass to prevent it from floating away. So maybe not quite an ocean pun like we previewed earlier, but we got a few horse puns in here as well. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I think we can kind of make this next one a two and one. Uh, Sonia is asking what our favorite seahorses are, uh, but we also have Chase asking what the difference between a seahorse and a sea dragon is. Well, what is the difference between a seahorse and a sea dragon, Jose? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. So they're both part of the same family of fish. 
Sea dragons are a little more specialized for how sea dragons live. Uh, I like to think of them as looking a lot like their seahorse cousins, just, uh, just slightly bigger and a little more stretched out. So you see how a seahorse uh, is kind of built to be up and down. They move kind of a vertical lifestyle uh, where I mentioned before, they're not super great at swimming, but they're really great at hanging onto things. So you can see how our seahorse is built kind of up and down. A sea dragon is kind of stretched out and it also has special, we call them appendages. There are different growths on its body uh, that make it look like the different plants that live where it lives. Very cool. Mm -hmm. All right, what about your favorite seahorse? What's your favorite seahorse, Jose? My favorite seahorse is the potbelly seahorse because they have a really big, it's called an abdomen. So that middle part over there, uh, you can see all of those bony plates on it. Um, and on a potbelly seahorse, that middle abdomen is just a little bit bigger. Uh, so you can really see all of the extra details there. Yeah. Well, where you like the big ones, I really like the small ones. So one of my favorites is the dwarf seahorse. They're super, super tiny, uh, and they almost look like baby seahorses their whole life. But they are full grown, even though they're so, so small. But I would say of all the cygnathids, my favorite is, of course, our weedy sea dragon. Um, we don't have a picture of it for us today, but you can always check it out on the Birch Aquarium website. Um, we have a couple blog posts but we were just really successful in breeding two more weedy sea dragons at the aquarium for the first time in our history. So we're very, very proud. All of our aquarist staff are working really hard to keep them happy and healthy. Uh, and they've grown uh, quite a bit for the past couple of months when they've been alive. I think they're about maybe three inches now, which in the, in the world of seahorses is, is pretty significant growth. Yeah, uh, we were talking to Aquarius Eric last week who gave us a really quick update. And I think that all sounds just like what he told us. They're doing really well uh, so far. And uh, I'm super glad that you like them because I know everyone at work loves that we're, we're able to be so successful with them and we're able uh, to keep that population going because it's important to be able to conserve things like that. Absolutely. Well, what does our seahorse sound like? I'm very curious as to know what sounds that it could possibly make. All right, so let's open our listening ears. All right, mm -hmm. kind of a thumping noise. Uh, oh. So like we were talking about earlier, uh, and Matt has been so good as to point out with all of our animals, a lot of animals have different adaptations and different body parts that help them sound the way they do. So what adaptations does a seahorse have to make those noises? I believe that noise that we just heard was what we call its snick. Now the snick is the sound that's made when our seahorses are feeding. Um, so if you notice on the image that we have on the screen right here, it has a very long and narrow snout, or it almost looks like a nose, but that's how they get their food. Um, they feed on little tiny shrimp that might be floating in the ocean. Uh, at the aquarium, we oftentimes give our seahorses mycid shrimp or other types of shrimp, depending on the size of the seahorse as well. And when they go and eat that food, they will move their snout really, really quickly. And their bony plates inside their body will make that little clicking or popping um, that is known as their snick. And do you know why a snick is always really important to hear or how it can tell us about the seahorse, Jose? Uh, because that means it's snack time. That does mean it's <laughs> uh, a really strong and vibrant snick is a very, very good way to indicate if our seahorses are healthy um, and if they're able to get their food to the best of their ability. And that can all inform a lot of our Aquarius decisions at the aquarium as well. Yeah. All right. So we've heard five different ocean animals. Uh, and now we know a little bit more about what the ocean sounds like. Now we're going to put it all together. Uh, Matt and I have paired two questions for you. So our first question is, why do these animals sound the way they do? We've kind of been talking back and forth about that kind of through our broadcast today. But if you want to post in the comments, Matt and I are going to keep talking a little bit more about this. And you guys can feel more than welcome to add your input. Yeah. It's always really interesting to think about why the animals sound that the way they do. So, So I think for two of our animals, we talked a little bit about uh, intruder alarms, right? With our, I believe it was our Garibaldi and our mantis shrimp. Mm -hmm. I believe someone in the comments said that that, uh, that mantis shrimp kind of sounded like a lion's growl. And I know we we're talking about a, a low rumbling noise. 
Um, and the Garibaldi, of course, doesn't sound exactly like the mantis shrimp, but it does have some of the same purposes. So because these Garibaldi are so territorial, they want to warn all the animals to know, don't come near my, my breeding ground or my feeding ground, um, or I have uh, protected my eggs. Um, and same kind of thing with the mantis shrimp. They'll produce that rumble, that lion's rumble almost, to warn off other animals that are getting a little too close and they're a little too close for comfort for our mantis shrimp. So a lot of the times our animals will be warning other animals to, to stay away as a first means of defense. Mm -hmm. That ties really well into Madeline's answer, uh, where she said that these animals sound the way they do for survival, like to find food and to find mates. Yes, absolutely. I'm sure sound plays a big part in a lot of our animals' uh, different types or, or needs in their life, whether it's reproducing, getting their food, or um, or just surviving and not getting eaten. Uh, yeah, and it looks like Sonia also has a really good example where, uh, a, a really good answer rather, where these animals are adapting to their environment and they're also communicating with each other and interacting with that environment. Absolutely. I think Sonia hit the nail on the head with that one. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely covering everything about why our animals uh, do make this sound and how it impacts their lives. Yeah. So they can do it to protect themselves. They can do it to communicate with other animals, uh, just like we have sound for all of these different reasons. Yeah, exactly. And our next question is, what does sound help these animals accomplish? Mm. Well, I think Sonia was kind of getting to that one with maybe um, mm -hmm. adapting to their environment or communicating with each other. Uh, there's still a lot to be learned, especially about our whale species and why they make all those noises that we've heard today. The humpback whale, of course, is one of the most widely known uh, sound producer in the ocean with those beautiful songs. Um, and it's not actually 100% understood why they do that or why they have certain clicks or thumps or, uh, or, or long cracks that come out of them as well. Um, for humpback whales, it was previously thought that the males would do that as a sign of finding a mate or establishing a male dominance in their social hierarchies, um, but it's also been documented in their feeding ground too. So a lot of research to be done to understand about why or what helps them, uh, how the sound helps them. And that's one of the reasons that Scripps Institution of Oceanography does everything that it does. We have a lot of different scientists who were working on research questions about sound. Some of you were asking great questions earlier about how far does sound travel in the ocean? How does sound work in the ocean? And tackling these specific questions is going to help us uh, unravel that. Like uh, we met with a Scripps scientist a few months ago, Regina uh, Guazzo, who is actually now with um, the, uh, working for the Navy researching how sound works with like ship traffic, right? Uh, mm -hmm. How whales are impacted by the noise of ships moving uh, through their habitats. Yeah, and I think that's a really important uh, conversation topic as well. We don't normally think of the oceans as a noisy place. Uh, maybe it's because when we're diving, we don't really hear much. Um, or when we do hear sound, it's kind of an ambient, drawn out, long noise. Um, but the, the sound that's produced from these coastal projects or development projects, um, and even the shipping lanes in and out of bays and across oceans can really encourage or uh, disrupt a lot of natural ocean animal sounds and production. Um, if you have something that sounds the same as a whale, then maybe it's gonna confuse other whale populations or uh, something in and around that fact. So understanding how our animals use it and why they have it um, can then inform how we can think about how to protect the ocean um, and not undermine their, their natural ability that they've um, adapted over millions and millions of years. That's absolutely right. So just to bring it all back, Matt, we learned a lot today. We, we did learn a lot today. We've got over all the animal kingdom in the ocean, really. We've got a good chance to hear some of these animals and, and see them and talk about some of our favorite ones as well. And I think except the mantis shrimp, these are all animals that we can see right here in San Diego. So we're really tying this all into uh, our local habitat here uh, at the Birch Aquarium. And uh, I'm just super encouraged to go out and learn more now. <laughs> Absolutely. No matter where you are, if you're in Southern California, like myself or around the world, take a look at your local environments and see if you can take a, a moment and hear uh, their, their interactions instead of just seeing them. I know we tend to, to focus on our eyes a lot, but listening can be just as important um, and sometimes even more important about learning and understanding about our animals. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, Matt, as always, it has been a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, I think it's time for us to go back to work at the aquarium uh, and do some things that we have to do uh, for the rest of it. But thanks so much to everyone in our chat for joining us. Uh, thanks so much for playing along and guessing what all the different animals sound like because you guys were right most of the time. And Matt can attest that I was not as correct when I was trying to guess these uh, <laughs> while we were trying to figure out what these animals sounded like the other day. Uh, so thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Matt, is there anything you'd like to say before we sign off? Oh, well, I just want to echo what you just said. Thank you so much um, for joining us today with our uh, Aquarius chat with Birch Aquarium. Hope you guys got a little bit of inspiration about sound in our oceans. Um, of course, check out our uh, the Aquarium website aquarium.ucsd.edu. We've got a lot of online resources for you all, some coloring pages, which is always really helpful. I know I've got my whale one uh, and my octopus one mm -hmm. kind of off to the side right now. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. It was a, a, a great experience to be on here and talk about something that I'm so passionate about. Mm -hmm. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, have a wonder del wonderful Delphin a day here in <laughs> sunny San Diego or wherever you're watching this from. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye, <laughs> right, everyone. See you next time. <laughs>